All right, guys, so uh, this is like a nice little uh, day trip, field trip from our normal uh, location <coughs> and class. So uh, today we're having a visiting speaker. This is really uh, quite uh, uh, a unique event uh, because obviously uh, one of the things that I like to mention is in my undergrad experience, we had a lot of filmmakers, a lot of media uh, people who were out there working in the industry or in the real world applying things that we were doing in class. Uh, and that's certainly the case with our speaker today, uh, Ilya. So uh, one of the things that I'll say, I'll keep my comments rather brief, but in class, as you know, we're exploring with different technologies and we did our interactive stories. Uh, we're heading into an area now where we're going to go into 360 video. And how does that affect the storytelling process? Does it inhibit the storytelling? Does it enhance the storytelling? Uh, and we've, we've had some good kind of discussion in class in terms of agreement or disagreement on whether this is helping or this is enhancing. And so uh, one of the, the things that I find particularly valuable in Ilya's case is that she's currently touring festivals with her uh, interactive VR project, uh, and she's actually making it happen on that level. And so as we're going through the presentation, I want you to think about that in terms of um, discussion and questions that you might pose to her you know, when she completes her, her presentation is, uh, it, how are you making this work? Is your story, is your message getting out there? Um, and what are some of the challenges that you faced and, and what are some of the, the things to consider uh, you know, as you become a, uh, a storyteller with immersive technology? So I'm going to ask that we give a warm welcome to Ilya Sila. So. Uh, thank you, Paul, for, for having me. Um, first, I just want to see a show of hands. Um, how many people have actually ever used um, Oculus Touch or, or Vive uh, with controllers? OK, so, so this is actually a really new thing for a lot of people. Um, and we can go later into the sort of what the ecosystem is for funding, for getting projects made, for distribution. Um, it's all in flux, but I'm sure that's something that everyone here is probably interested in. Um, I'm not going to specifically uh, talk about that. We can definitely talk about it later. So um, today, the way I'm going to sort of um, go through this is to sort of give you a general idea of my approach to storytelling in virtual reality. Um, I started out doing interactive stories online and this um, project, Queer Skin's A Love Story, uh, is actually uh, based on the story, the large online multimedia narrative that um, I and my um, long-term artistic partner, Cyril Sobolski, put out in 2013. Um, so we'll go through that a little bit um, just to show you how um, changing platforms might change how you approach story. Um, it's also an incredibly technically sophisticated project. Um, and I will talk to you a little bit about why we use the technology that we used for, this, um, for, for telling this story. Um, so I'm just going to start out with a basic proposition. Um, it's so basic um, that it seems obvious, but it's actually um, pretty important. And that is that storytelling is really a way of organizing information. Um, and that information can be um, in different forms, different kind of media presented on different platforms. Um, and each of those media types and each of those platforms for interaction um, uh, excel at presenting certain forms of storytelling and also certain kinds of information. And that information is processed differently. So start to think about that in the back of your minds that visual information is processed differently than auditory information is processed differently than text. Again, it's completely obvious, but when you start telling stories, this is something that you're gonna, if you don't already intuit it, will actually start to really think about. Um, and then this is a question which I have my own answer for. You guys are gonna each have your own answer. Um, but uh, as I take you through this, I'm hoping that by the end, um, you'll start to think about what kinds of information virtual reality privileges. And also, 
what is it that organizes reality for visitors in virtual reality? It's not so obvious. Okay. Okay, so I'm just gonna put this out there. If you wanna tell a story in virtual reality, the first question you need to ask is, why am I making a story in virtual reality? And if you don't have a good answer to that question, why it's not a book, why it's not a film, um, why it's not an interactive online thing or an app or a game, then don't, don't go forward until you have figured that out because um, you will be bound probably for failure at a very early point because you don't actually understand why you're using it. Um, for me, and I'm gonna take you through this, um, the most um, uh, important thing for me in creating stories in virtual reality is, that, is to remember that virtual reality is a spatial medium. It is a spatial medium. If you don't understand that and you're not harnessing that, you need to be doing that, you need to be ignoring that for a reason, not just because you didn't think about it. Okay, so this is what I call the rule of bodies. Um, and oh, I'm just gonna put this out here. So this is, um, I am a little biased about this. And the reason is that um, I am uh, trained, uh, and part of the story is actually influenced by uh, my being a physician. I am still a practicing physician. Um, I actually, work part-time at Rikers Island Correctional Facility as a doctor in New York City. Um, and I just worked last night, actually. Um, so, so my relationship to embodied experience in a virtual space is, I, let, let's put it this way, acute. Um, it's something that I am hyper aware of on a uh, daily basis because of my profession. So it does influence the way I tell stories. Um, nevertheless, I think I'm right about this. Um, and why, uh, what is it about virtual reality that is so special? Um, for me, and I think pretty much for everyone, it is that feeling of what they call presence. And presence is actually a neuroscientific term. Um, I'm not gonna go into the neuroscience of it, but it seems to be a very basic evolutionary mechanism for ways that we started to distinguish between self and other as we were evolving. It's a very primordial form of consciousness of feeling that you are in this space in this time and feeling a separation between yourself and the environment and having a motor map of the environment. That is what presence is. Now there are other forms of presence that are um, socially and culturally dictated, how you feel connected to other bodies, other parts of that environment, and that um, can be influenced on, on sort of higher cognitive levels. Um, I'm not gonna go into that. It's something for, the, for those of you who are really interested in thinking about storytelling in virtual reality, you might wanna actually go further into um, just the sort of theoretical underpinnings of presence um, is what I would say. Bottom line, Construct your story in four dimensions, all right? You've got three-dimensional space, you've got time, and obviously 360 degrees. Um, don't forget that there's a behind you. Um, and then be mindful on that note of how bodies organize space. We have eyes in front of our heads, okay? So, so we are organized to look forward. Um, so there is a, if you really want someone um, to see something right off, you're beginning a story, put it right in front of them. You know, if you want the surprise factor, have them look in a different direction, have a noise go in the back, and then suddenly they gotta turn around and boom, you've got your story. These are the things that you need to start thinking about in terms of storytelling and virtual reality, okay? Um, now VR, um, is, as Paul mentioned, um, a big part of film festivals now. Every major film festival has virtual reality. Um, the major film institutes fund virtual reality. We got a prototype grant from Tribeca Film Institute and a small grant from Sundance um, to make uh, queer skins. Um, so film is a big part of this. Um, games are obviously a big uh, influence on how people construct in virtual reality. But what I'm gonna argue is that 
<clears throat> there is no codified language for virtual reality storytelling as of yet. If you go back and look at the beginning of film, okay, <clears throat> in the early 1900s, if you start looking <clears throat> at film, what you will see is that the language was not, um, was not set yet. So you have people working um, and telling stories in very different ways than we, that we would see right now is very experimental. But at the time, there was no language for cinema. Um, was it drawing from theater? Yes, absolutely. So what did, you, what did you end up having? You ended up having people with these incredible gestures. I mean, it was like these, if you go back, watch, watch like Metropolis, something, a silent film. Watch how they're trying to communicate in a language that has not been developed yet. That's where we are in VR. So the language is not codified. People are going to start to read your stories through the things that they know. And yes, yes, film is one of them. Yes, games is one of those. But there are so many places to draw inspiration from. Architecture, um, installation and performance art. I'm going to go through some of the stuff that we did in that. Dance, our next uh, episode for Queer Skins is actually going to involve dance. Why? Because of this fact that VR is a spatial medium. Okay. So if there's no universal code, you got to give people a little bit of help. You got to give them a sense of where to go, what to do. Um, it's not obvious. And what I will tell you is that you think that interactivity and virtual reality might be completely obvious. It's not. <laughs> the most simple things can become complicated for people in virtual reality. So just bear this in mind that you have to provide some form of orientation, some form of landmark for people um, in your storytelling. So for, I'm going to put some things out there. These are not necessarily true for every story. Um, these were true for our story. Um, but there's some things to think about. Again, the body is um, a way that or we organize our experience in VR through our bodies. So things that are in front, things that are at eye level will definitely be seen um, uh, more apparently than, than if you put things behind them. Um, uh, I'm going to go through why, why hands are important. We'll get to that. Um, story, old fashioned story. OK, everybody knows this. Plot character development, and then user point of view, all right? You've, you, you can situate people within your story if you give them an idea of who they're supposed to be, what position are they supposed to play in this story? Are they the fly on the wall? Are they a character? Wh who are they? That, that is a point of orientation for people, and that's something you need to keep in mind. Um, and then the familiar. Genres, okay? You know what? Queer Skins is a melodrama. There's no other way to put it. Um, I happen to love melodrama. Why? Because one, um, at least in my experience, it's real. <laughs> I don't know about your lives. They may be perfect. In mine, my life is a melodrama. <laughs> okay, so, so that's number one. Number two, you, you want to do, hey, do a Western. Do a Western in VR. Do, you know, some form. Take a genre and then start exploring that genre. The genre gives people a way of understanding what your story is going to be. So you can meet those expectations. Um, interactions, again, I cannot uh, emphasize this enough. Um, and I'll go through what interactions we used in Queer Skins. But um, unless you're dealing with a real gaming population, do not make it too complicated because people will spend their time, you will break immersion, trying to figure out what it is they're supposed to do in this space. So keep that in mind. Um, and then past experience. Um, you know, we, I, I'm developing for a, 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 you know, English speaking, uh, Western audience that understands sort of the Western film traditions. That's who I'm developing for. If I went and showed this piece in India, I don't know, it might not work the same way. So just be aware of, of what people's expectations are. And I'm going to go into how we actually used or tried to use every visitor's own past experience as part of the storytelling. That's pretty unusual. Um, 
we, we made a concerted effort to do this as part of the storytelling mechanics. And then aesthetics. <clears throat> I will just say, everything speaks. Every detail matters. It may not need to be exactly that detail. There may be a hundred answers to the question you're asking, but it matters because in this space where there is no codified language, people are reading everything to get clues to what this is all about. So I will um, not mention any names, but I will say that there, is a, there was an extremely expensive virtual reality piece at Tribeca that has since traveled around to major film festivals, um, which used a uh, horrible font. <laughs> like, the f there was a lot of text, which is also eh, a little, I mean, you can use text in VR. We, we could go into why or why not. But that was, so that was, a, that was a risk. But then they just like seemed to forget that the font actually mattered. And, and I don't know if it was a tech problem, meaning they had to use a font that really showed up you know, reading in VR is not so easy, but it just seemed completely missing what the story was about. So those details matter that you might not think so going through, but I'm going to say is look at everything because people are looking around for clues. And if you make a mistake, like in a font, people, that throws people off and it's, it, for me, it destroyed the experience. Um, now, I'm aesthetically oriented. Some people maybe not so much, but I would say be detail oriented. Understand that every choice speaks something and understand what it's speaking. Um, and then lastly, sound is spatially orienting. It's so important. I'm gonna show you how we use sound. Um, sound, if you actually, if you think about it also, is something that really harnesses the visitor's imagination. They start a story, a sound is an event, and they start a story in their head with sound. So think about not only how sound can spatially orient, but how sound can be used to harness your visitor's imagination, your vi therefore your visitor's sense of being part of that story, okay? So now I'm going to back up my claim about um, the importance of bodies in space and how we know things that goes back to this idea of storytelling as a form of organizing information. I'm going to be all over the place on this. Some of you may be interested, some of you may not be, but it's, I think it's fascinating. So um, this, um, there is a term, so for a long time, people had this idea that we were like these human computers. Like we would have an input and things would happen in our brain and then we would have an output and, and that's, how, that's how brains worked. Well, it turns out this is maybe not the case. Um, and there is this thing called embodied cognition. This is a pretty famous book that came out in the early 1990s, um, which basically said that the relationship between, um, that this input and this output was actually sort of networked, that our bodies and our, our relationship to the environment um, and our relationship to interactions with that, that was actually what was determining, in part, how we responded to things, how we actually processed that information, that it was this bottom experience of being in space that actually influenced how our brains worked. So it wasn't a matter of these representational symbols being manipulated, it was actually a cognition was a bodily experience. Think about that. So what does a body see? Okay, so um, this is uh, from uh, this is a, actually a, a, a map, a cortical map of the brain. It's a funny, funny slide. I'll go through this. Um, so there was a neurosurgeon in the 1950s named Wilder Penfield who was the first person to map um, the human brain. So what he did was he took uh, patients who were undergoing um, uh, neurosurgery for treatment for, um, for refractive epilepsy, and he, while they were awake, because the brain actually has no sensory neurons, while they were awake, he was, they were awake, he would put these um, electrodes in the brain and ask people what they felt. And then therefore, he mapped out what the, what the human brain actually sees. And if you look at the amount of cortical brain space that's devoted to different parts of the body, um, what you see is <laughs> we're basically hands and mouths. <laughs> That's basically what we walk around the world, being big pairs of hands and big, big mouth. That's what, that's what we are. That's how we sense the world. So 
that's, these are, this is, um, you know, million years of evolution. So don't take, don't neglect that. Don't, you know, this is, there's a reason that hands make a really important part of experience. How we're gonna end up using mouths and tongues, I don't know, I'm not gonna go there. <laughs> it's up to you guys, you'll figure it out, I'm sure. Um, okay, I'm gonna bring up another thing. So what we consider to be information has been highly influenced by this uh, debate that happened during the Macy cybernetic conferences. And this was a sort of a little argument between a guy named Claude Shannon, who is really the father of information theory, and this guy, British physicist Donald McKay. And what Shannon really wanted was information to be quantifiable. So he basically said, you know what, information is just this sort of um, information that's traveled, we don't really care what, if the, what the receiver thinks about it at the end, it's what, how we transmit from point A to point B that matters. Donald McKay said, well, you know what, like no, no human being just like gets some, some kind of message and that like makes sense to them. If, if they can't, if you can't read the message, it actually is no information. So, so he wanted to put meaning back into what information was. So don't, I'm gonna say this, um, we are not computers, so think about how people are processing meaning, and that also relates to how they are receiving that information. Is it touch? Is it vision? Is it through the ears? And how does that information, how does meaning get into that information? So we talked a little bit about, about sound. These I don't have answers for these, and these are not, honestly, maybe, some neuroscientists are asking these questions about VR, but in general, in storytelling in VR, people aren't really asking these questions. I want you guys to start thinking about this. Okay. Oh, and this is great. If you want a really amazing book, like this is, everyone who makes in VR should read this book. So Henri Bergson was this French philosopher who wrote this incredible book called Matter and Memory, where he basically said, the universe is just consists of infinite number of images coming to us, infinite number of images. And the ones that we select out, the ones that we notice, okay? Think about that. The ones that we notice are the ones that are related to two things. The main thing is our bodies. Does it affect our bodily existence? Does it re reflect our desires, our fears? What does it, does it, if it doesn't reflect that at all, we don't even know, we don't notice it. We do not notice it. Um, so that's something to think about when you come to virtual reality. What he also said was that kind of uh, attention can be overridden by memory can be completely overridden by memory. And I'll just give you an example. So there was a, um, this was a couple of years ago, there was a 360 video of uh, an Ebola outbreak somewhere in Africa. Um, and it was just, it was, um, it was in a gear and I, I was at a function and I sat down and I, I was watching this thing. And I actually spent, as a, as a resident, I spent about um, three months in Kenya doing uh, malaria research. And it was one of the most amazing times of my life. And so I'm sitting there and there's this whole thing about the Ebola, but I'm like watching the marketplace and the sounds. And I was like, I was taken back to my time in Africa. Honestly, the story was utterly lost on me because my memory overrode that story that was being told. And that's actually what Bergson is talking about. Okay. Oh, I love this. Okay, Marinetti, he's such a bad boy. Okay, so <clears throat> Marinetti, um, Italian futurist, did so many things. Okay, he was a fascist too, but we won't go into that. <laughs> Bottom line is that he um, had this idea of total theater. Basically, he had an idea that there would be this, there would not be a divide anymore between the audience and the storyteller, that all our senses would be used in um, experiencing a story. So in a way, kind of like immersive theater, like I don't know if anyone's heard of Sleep No More, that kind of thing, where you actually um, become part of the story in, in real physical form. Um, so he, he developed this idea, and then he also talked about something which I love. This is a small manifesto. It's completely hyperbolic because it is a manifesto, but 
he basically talks about the possibility that there are more than five senses, that there's actually other ways of sensing the world that we have not discovered. So I don't know that we are going to discover those, but I think that virtual reality might actually be a really interesting place to start thinking about that and about new, very new ways of telling stories. Okay. So this is Queerskin's a novel. This is online. Um, it is a massive interactive storytelling project. Um, and uh, it was set up basically um, uh, like an, uh, how do I put this? A multimedia scrapbook is what I would say. Um, and this, so Queerskin's is a story of a young gay physician from a rural Catholic Missouri family who dies of AIDS in 1990. And it's, inspired by my experiences treating HIV patients. Um, I was actually a resident uh, before this class of drugs called the protease inhibitors came out, um, which changed everything. Um, and uh, people actually, when we were at Tribeca, thought that he was real. And the reason is just because I've lived him for 10 years and I wrote 40,000 words of his diary text. Um, so I know him really well. Um, this uh, online is 40,000 words of original diary text, two hours of audio monologues from five characters who knew him, um, uh, crowdsourced um, photographs um, from Flickr, um, videos uh, from YouTube, and then also commissioned videos uh, from a LA-based filmmaker, um, Gerard Gurry. Uh, and, and basically, I'll, I'll play a little bit of this. What I want you to notice, though, because when, when I move into the virtual reality, I want you to notice that um, how things change, how things, what things might be the same, um, and, and how the storytelling changes, okay? So this, again, is set up like a, like a virtual scrapbook. You can play audio, you can play movies, you can read the diary, and you can move these around. And, and, and most people, it's sort of set up as um, digital collages. I mean, some people have been assigned this for class, and so maybe they have, I, I don't actually think it's ever been assigned in its entirety because it's massive, um, but parts of it have been assigned. Um, but the point was actually to uh, allow people to even do a page and get a full experience out of that. It's not going to be as rich as if you did more, but, but it, it, needs to, it needed to be in a, uh, made in a way, constructed in a way that, that people could actually um, get something out of just consuming a little bit of it, because I know what the sort of um, attention span of people is nowadays. Okay. So let me just play this. So again, um, let's, uh, let me just go here, oh, okay. So that was the beginning. Um, and I'm gonna show you how we ended up using um, some of the stuff that was in, oh, thank you, that was in um, uh, the online version, uh, bringing it into the, uh, the virtual reality version. But when I started writing the virtual reality version, I realized I couldn't, just go straight off of what we had made online, that I, I needed to come up with a way um, for making it, um, for translating the story um, that I wanted to tell. Um, and so 
how did we decide to organize reality for Queer Skin's a Love Story? Um, okay, so the body is really important, especially in this piece, because this is about a body that dies. I mean, this is about mortality. So if I'm not invoking that in this story, I'm either being trying to be really sort of transcendental or I'm just lying. Um, so body was really important. So, so what did we use? Um, we used three, depth kit 3D volumetric um, video. Has anyone ever heard of 3D volumetric video? No, okay, check it out. <laughs> I'll, I'll show you what it can do. Um, basically what it does is, um, and I'll just briefly go into this, um, it combines a connect with a very high-end um, DSLR camera um, and, and, uh, and then software. DepthKit is uh, made by a group called Scatter uh, in New York City. They are what, you can go to Sony Studio, I think Intel has one now, and use their um, sort of um, volumetric capture. That'll cost you probably $100,000 a day, maybe, maybe more. Um, but but DepthKit actually has a software that you, as an artist, can get for 100 bucks for a year, okay, to use. Um, so <clears throat> what we did was, um, uh, for us, um, the, the, because we wanted to invoke the body, um, it was really important that we uh, not just do this in um, 360 video. 360 video would have been pretty easy to shoot um, this scene because it all takes place in the back seat of a Cadillac. You are seated behind um, the man who's died uh, parents as they take this sort of um, journey down a memory lane through rural Missouri um, to a cemetery where their son is buried. Um, so it's, 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 you know, it's space limited. We could have, we could have filmed it there, but um, I, for me, 360 is still too flat and I didn't want that. Um, I wanted you to feel the tension in the front seat and I'll talk a little bit about that. So we use 3D volumetric video. Um, choreography, I'm gonna show you. We actually, I, f I understood that you were in such close proximity to these two parents. And so you're actually, and you can't see, you, you can see a bit of their faces, but you don't see, they don't turn around and look at you. Well, actually, Mary Helen turns around once and looks at you, but um, they don't, you're not seeing the entirety of their faces. So how are they transmitting what's going on inside them? They're transmitting it with their bodies, okay? And you're close enough to read their body language, and it's incredibly powerful. So I needed to f actually, uh, formalize that as part of the storytelling. And we actually worked with a choreographer, uh, Don Saito, to choreograph gesture um, in, in our actors. And I'll show you a bit of that. Um, and then sound. Again, sound is spatial. So it's you relate to sound through your body. It's where, where am I in relationship to that sound? That is not, there's nothing, um, you don't sort of imagine that sound being somewhere out there that has no relationship to your body. So spatial sound. Um, and I have a funny story about that, which I can tell later, because we actually um, ended up getting, this is a crazy story, and this, this speaks to the sort of the production of one of these, how, how, what, the, what the workflows are, what the ecosystem is. Um, so we actually ended up getting Skywalker um, sound to do our 3D, um, our audio post-production and um, uh, spatial design. Uh, like, that means like Luke Skywalker sound. <laughs> right. Okay, yeah, I, I can tell you how we did that later if you're interested, okay. Um, okay, story, plot, character, or user point of view. What do we want? We wanted you to feel a little bit of lack of agency, actually. We wanted you to feel a little bit of helpless in this situation. Many people, when they went through this, have said, oh my gosh, I know this situation. I, under, I remember this. I remember being in the backseat of a car when I was a kid and my parents fighting and I felt helpless. I just wanted to get away, but I couldn't get away and, and I couldn't say anything and I couldn't do anything and I just wanted to get out of there. Um, so that's what we kind of did here. You are very close, very privy to this conversation, which gets increasingly intense, um, and you can't leave. <laughs> you can't, you are helpless. Um, so that lack of agency relates to the story of this being the end. There is no going back. You will get to the cemetery, he, he is dead. He is not, there is no, at a certain point, you give up agency because there is nothing more that you can do. And that was important to bring into the storytelling mechanics for us. 
Um, and also the intimacy. We wanted you to be really close to this story. Okay. I talked about the backseat of the car and being a child. So that's, again, past experience. Um, someone who's not used to being in a car might not have that same experience, but that's something in, in, the, in, you know, in the United States is, is something that people do recognize. Um, genre, I talked about melodrama. And then interactions. The interactions in this piece are super simple. Um, basically, there's a drama going on in very close proximity in the front seat. And then there's this um, box of belongings, which have been sent back with um, Sebastian, the man who's died body, uh, to Missouri. And this box of belongings, the contents changes over the experience. And all you have to do is reach into the box and take things out and look at them. That is it, OK? That's what you got to do. Just go into the box. It's very simple, simple interaction which, believe it or not, some people just could not get the hang of. So keep that in mind. Um, we wanted, why did we use such a simple interaction? We wanted you part of the story. We wanted you to feel that you were actually interacting with things. But we didn't want it to be so complicated to, so as to break immersion. Very important for us. OK. And the aesthetics. OK. The tech that we used is, um, was highly complicated, um, would have been incredibly expensive had we not gotten a lot of really great, very smart, talented people to work for no money or very little money for us. Um, <clears throat> but why did we do it? We really wanted this magical, realist aesthetic. So because we wanted you to feel um, that it was uh, both a, a reality and also a memory. Um, and, and so to do that, we needed to find an aesthetic sweet spot. And we did this by combining the 3D volumetric video. It's actually hyper real. It's probably the best 3D volumetric um, depth kit I've ever seen post-production wise. It's not abstract at all, as you'll see. Um, and uh, then we shot, so what you have is you have in the front seat, you have 3D volumetric live action. You have a car, the Cadillac, which you're sitting in, was actually a 1986 Cadillac Sedan DeVille that I found on Craigslist, somebody selling. And I said, hey, if I give you 100 bucks, can we use it for an afternoon? We want to do photogrammetry. We won't hurt it at all. So uh, we did photogrammetry uh, with an amazing guy, Pat Goodwin, who uh, does photogrammetry and 3D modeling. Um, and he then 3D modeled this car um, for us, which is why it's exquisitely beautiful. It does not look like a CGI car because it is not a CGI car. It's photogrammetry. Um, and, and then finally, you're driving through um, a landscape which is shot on location in rural Missouri uh, with 360 video. And we wanted it, you to be almost like driving through a home movie. And actually, we had our colorist um, made a very good suggestion, super smart guy. Um, he said, why don't we add a little grain to it? Like, it really is a home, home movie. So he ended up adding, after he did the coloring, he ended up adding grain to the video. So it does have a very subtle sense of being like a home movie that you're driving through. And so all of this was hugely expensive, um, incredibly complicated. And we didn't do it because we were excited. I mean, yeah, the tech is exciting. But honestly, I mean, we didn't have a budget. And we, were, we didn't know what the hell we were doing. This is our first virtual reality project. So this is, if, if we were really wanted to be really smart about this, we wouldn't have done any of the stuff that we did. But we needed it for the storytelling. So that's what we did. Um, okay, I talked about that. OK. And so I think this is actually just a trailer. I'm going to play it. Um, He's been dead to you for a long time, hasn't he? Ever since James. What's the last time you spoke to him or wrote to him? Well, 
what is that but the definition of joy? So that is actually, um, that text is from the diary from online. So I, I didn't just take every, throw it away and be like, oh, that's just a different project. No, I, I try to use it in a, in a very um, simple but um, very impactful way in the storytelling. In fact, you have this diary you can pick up, you can turn the pages, um, and, and there's more. This, they were actually one of, you, that, what you heard was one of seven possible entries. It's randomized, so every time you do it, you'll get a different diary entry. And people just, once they got the diary, many people just spent the whole time like reading the, <laughs> reading the diary, which is valid. That's actually, if that's what you want, that's fine. There's a drama playing out in the front seat. If you want to just kind of occasionally look up, that's okay. Again, um, it's up to you to decide how much agency you want to give your visitor and how much freedom you want to give them to this, to, to tell the story themselves. Um, so interesting thing about this is that it was really important for us that you didn't, and, I, and maybe you guys have seen this in VR, we didn't want you to like get to play a gay man for five minutes and then get out a headset. Like we just thought that was like just awful. <laughs> just no, the answer is no. Because you know, the fact of the matter is, is that, and, and, and part of the using the real in this is that we want to recognize that you know when you when you take off the headset, you're still going to be black or gay or a woman or not, and you're still going to have to deal with the political and social um, and cultural and economic realities of being in that body. And we did not want to take that away from this story. So rather than do that, we wanted you to be the one constructing who this guy was and how do you construct him well you get a little bit a little bit from the parents but they're not really talking about his character they're talking about more about their relationship to him you're getting him through this box of belongings that you're interacting with so your history your biases are being brought into this so you you lift up this this um uh, uh you know 1960s beautiful plaster cast um uh statue of the virgin mary um all of these objects are 3D scanned archival objects, by the way. Again, very important for us to bring the real into this storytelling experience. Um, uh, your relationship, if you're, if you're a devout Catholic person, you might have a very different relationship to the Statue of Virgin Mary than someone who's Jewish or someone who is atheist. You're just gonna have a different relationship and your view of who this person was is gonna be colored by your own background. So that was really important. Um, you know, we also have, this is kind of a joke that I put in, but it actually, this is true. Technically, I, I, so I would buy these objects on eBay and I bought these um, Tom of Finland, I don't know if anyone knows who Tom of Finland is, physique pictorial. So these were um, cartoons and also um, nudes, semi-nudes of, of men um, uh, that was, was promoted as a sort of like bodybuilding magazines, but it was really for gay men to look at other men. Um, and, and so these, for, I, got, I went to a like, battle to the death on eBay getting some of these archival ones because those, those are in high demand, actually. Um, the Statue of the Virgin Mary from the 1960s, not so much. <laughs> um, and, and so I tried to scan them and I just, like I was, so I was using a structured sensor and I, I, I tried to scan these. I would put the, pile them up and they just, they wouldn't scan. So I was like, oh, you know what, let me just try it. So I put them actually next to a Grey's Anatomy textbook because Sebastian is a physician. And, um, and it, that was, it scanned. So it's actually really beautiful. <laughs> if you pick up the Grey's Anatomy in the box, um, and then you turn it over, you'll actually see these, this pile of Tom of Finland physique pictorials. And I, I loved it because a couple of people got it. It's like two impossible anatomies put together. Um, but in any case, your relationship to seeing those Tom of Finland cartoons, if you're gay, is going to be very different than if you are a straight um, man. That's just going to be, in fact, when we were at SIGGRAPH, which is the big computing society uh, meeting, uh, we, uh, this very nerdy tech, tech oriented, super tech oriented, and people like some of the guys would pick up that and turn it over and find the Tom of Finland. And it was like, they would throw it out the window. <laughs> like we could watch what was going on in the headset. It was like, okay, I'm not looking, I'm not looking. In any case, my point is that your relationship to that character is different depending on what your relationship to those objects is. Um, and, and that was part of the storytelling mechanics. Um, all right, I just want you to hear the, how we started this. Oh, wait a second, that's not it. Okay. Um, I think this 
this is just the trailer again. Yeah, okay. Um, so, oh no, here it is. Let me see if I can get this up. Okay, so that's the beginning of Queerskin's a love story. We used sound. Why? Because you are already, your job in this experience is to start telling this story. And so we used sound to actually start you off telling you what you were gonna do here. And that's what you're gonna do. You're gonna start by telling the story. And, and you knew what was happening here. It was, you know that there's two people, they're walking on gravel, they get into a car, the car turns down, and now you're in a car. But that beginning experience you has oriented you to your task in this um, virtual reality experience. Um, okay, so this again, just quickly, what, what our goals were, we talked about that, and then how we did it. I'm just going to bring you really quickly through what this took, because we did it in, we got a grant from Tribeca in May, we started sh shooting, we did the photogrammetry, here we are, uh, in an empty lot in Brooklyn in August. Um, and then we premiered at Tribeca in April of the next year. And let me show you what I did, what we did. It wasn't just me, it was a lot of people. Um, okay, so this is Pat Goodwin. We're doing photogrammetry on a 1986 uh, Cadillac sedan DeVille. And uh, I have to take, <laughs> am I, I'm just not good at tech. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I'm just not good. I'm good at writing, I'm good at directing, I'm good at storytelling, but I'm... Yeah. So this is my, like, I have to take exact measurements of this car so that why? We can make a green screen set, a green screen car set. Why? Because when we shoot this, we're going to be shooting these actors, right? And they actually, in the 3D volumetric, become game objects that then get put into Unity. And they're going to be put into, in, the, in Unity, into this model car. And guess what? We, don't have, we can stretch a little bit, but if we start stretching a lot, they're going to look really funny. So we got to actually be within a range to make both of those pieces work together. Um, so that was an expense we had to have. And this is my living room. And um, this is Don Saito between these two, behind these two actors. Uh, who's the choreographer that we use for this. Um, and I'm just going to, this is, I'm going to give you a little bit of this rehearsal. Uh, what we actually did was, uh, when I started out talking to the actors, um, we, uh, I showed them Metropolis. And I said, this is the beginning of film. Watch what they're doing with their hands. They're all, they're making these huge gestures. And I said, okay, now I want you to do the scene and I want you to, uh, do the gestures like twice as big as you would. Just like feel funny, feel stupid doing it, doing it. And we'll, we'll film you from behind and I'm gonna show you how it's not stupid. Um, and then we choreograph that. So that between the husband and wife, there's this kind of missed call and response, missed call and response. Um, and I'll just play a little bit of this. Oops. They should have been there no matter what. So those, the, those rehearsals were super intense, as you might imagine. Um, and we filmed from the back, and the actors studied them themselves from the back um, to go forward for, for further rehearsals. This is us on green screen set. Now we have our green screen and our green screen room. Um, this is Corey Allen, our DP. And this is the setup that you get with depth kit. So you're getting depth data, and you are getting um, texture data from the DSLR um, that's going to go on top of that depth data. And we're using two cameras, um, sort of positioned to catch each of them um, in the position of the, where the, the visitor will be. Uh, this is our uh, 
sound engineer, um, Laura Cunningham, uh, who did some amazing ideas with um, how to use sound in this. Um, it's me. Okay. So we actually had to do a full um, tech rehearsal. Why? Because we needed to make sure that all our cameras, all our lighting, all the way the actors were interacting with each other and with the set was actually going to make sense once we got the depth data into the mock, into the car, right? So we had 48 hours to do that. I didn't do it. Cyril did it. Uh, 48 hours to do that. Um, in the meantime, we did audio recordings on the, on the set. Um, and so this was, uh, what you see here is, this is the crude mock-up of that that said to us, OK, yeah, we got it. We can do this. So we went from that to that. That's the final product. Um, it's Beautifully lit by Pat Goodwin also. Um, and in between, um, we had a lot of things going on. We, f we found a guy, a stranger, on Facebook through various things. We wanted, we thought, uh, should we shoot? Nobody's done this, actually. Should we, should we have a CGI car? Should we put people in this car and then actually drive through a 360 landscape? Can we do that? I think it looked great. Should we do it? Because we're going to have to go to Missouri to do this. Should we do it? So I get on Facebook and I say, uh, you know, just went out to the sort of hive mind and I said, does anyone have any footage taken from a moving car of 360 video that we could just pop into, you know, Unity and just see if it's what we would are interested in? And a friend of a friend said yes, and now I'm going to connect you with this guy who probably does. And um, this guy is Richard Hammer, uh, who ended up shooting 360 video in Missouri for us. Um, when we met him, we met him in the Missouri, in, in the St. Louis airport, having never, ever met before. <laughs> so it could have been awful, four days driving around rural Missouri shooting video, or it was, but as it turned out, um, it was magical. It was a magic experience. And I'm just going to put it out there because people who are very tech oriented in computer program maybe here, Understand this, there is so much we don't know about how we experience the world and process information. So Cyril goes, because he you know, he's my tech component, he says, can we just go shoot it in upstate New York? Because like, it's going to be a lot cheaper. And I said, no, we cannot do that. We have to go to rural Missouri, because something's going to happen there. That it's going to influence the rest of our storytelling, and we don't even know how. And Absolutely, that is true. There is no question about it that going forward, our aesthetic, how we, I mean, look at this, look at this photograph. Don't tell me that, that we didn't start to see what the color palette was going to be with these, these kind of scenes, because that's exactly what happened. It's this kind of, so, so be aware, again, of how you want to tell this story and the fact that maybe you don't know everything here and be open to different possibilities. So I'll just take you th quickly through rural Missouri because it was a special place. Largest bullet making factory in the United States in Sedalia. Um, and that's, oh, again, serendipity. Who knows how this happens? So we're the last day there, we drive into St. Genevieve um, around 4.30 in the afternoon, and, and, and I, I say to Sarah, we have not found the cemetery. And I say to Sarah, okay, it's St. Genevieve, there's gotta be a cemetery here. So, so Google, we, we drive up to this place, it's a Catholic cemetery, old, like with, with graves from like the late 1700s, okay? And, and we have two hours till sunset. So we found it, and we, we went back to, the, to, the, to our Airbnb. We had a beer. We got back at sunset, and we shot this, and, and, and that was magic. Um, OK, and then what else happened? Um, a lot of eBay buying and me figuring out how to 3D scan with a structure sensor. Did we figure out how to decrease pixel count? No, because you know what? I'm sorry. I'm just like, I, I'm never going to learn that. And, and we, so we spent money on getting someone who was good at it to decrease pixel count. Um, if you're interested in 3D scanning, which is a beautiful mode of, of again, transmitting information, um, uh, you just have to keep that in mind. Um, Tom of Finland, Mary with a broken nose. OK. I was going to put something else out there. 
There is something really magic that happens combining the virtual and the real. I don't know. Not many people are talking about this because we're at really at the beginning of this. This is really about a transmedia experience and a way of really doing immersive storytelling. Not everyone is going to do this, but for those of you who are interested, who might, who, okay, I'm just going to tell this. I've never done an installation in my entire life, ever. I've ne well, I've never actually taken an art class ever. Or, I mean, I don't adv <laughs> not advising you not to do that. Go for it. Um, but the fact of the matter is that um, this is a new territory. So be brave. Damn it, do it. Just do it. Just be brave. Do your homework. Be brave. Find the people you need to work with, and and get it done. So um, I really wanted because of this intersection between the real and the virtual, I really wanted uh, to do installation. And we were incredibly fortunate that Tribeca gave us a $10,000 commission to do an interactive installation. Um, they picked five out of 30 projects, we were one, um, to do an installation. And, um, and it turned out to be incredibly important. Um, so what we did for Tribeca, and we have now gone on to do multiple site-specific installations, each of them being uh, different uh, from this. This was the first. Um, for this um, uh, installation, what we wanted to do was sort of recreate Sebastian's Missouri attic bedroom, but sort of remade as a space of memory and imagination. Um, and so what we did was, let's see if I can get here, all right. Um, I actually don't have a beginning, the, the first part of it. Um, we actually wanted to just sort of give you the, the code for attic. So what we did was we worked with our set designers who did the green screen um, car set for us um, to create the, basically just um, hmm, a symbol of an attic, I guess would be the best way to, to an architectural symbol. So you have a sort of uh, A-line structure. We had pink um, insulation, styrofoam boards, classic sort of, everyone read it as, we had a, a light hanging from the bare bulb, hanging from the, from the entryway, made site specific for Tribeca. Um, and as you walked in, um, you were met by this arm, back of this armoire that had, this whole site was historically accurate archival objects. This is um, a, uh, fl a flyer from a, a, a artist activist group called Grand Fury, which was very active at the beginning of the AIDS epidemic. This is from 1986. It's actually from my own collection. They had a show at NYU in 2012, and they remade all of these multiples, and, and this is mine. Um, so we, again, I'm orienting you. This is in your face. Yes, it is, and, and now you know what we're, we're going through. So you have the attic, and as you pull back the, um, the canvas curtain of this dreary kind of attic space, you came into what I call the drag hallway, and boy, was this beautiful. So we, we actually were working with, uh, as part of it, we had to figure out what to do with this floor-to-ceiling mirror. Um, and so we decided to make it like a glamour hallway. Um, and so uh, we did. That's a taffeta, purple taffeta rose runner, bridal runner I got off of Etsy. Home Depot is my friend. Um, so you walked in and there were live flowers which died over the 10 days. That was important. Um, and, oops, and then uh, a, a looped uh, video. This video of a man touching his chest is actually from the online originally. Um, and you, were, you could interact in any way you wanted um, in this space. There were artist multiples hand stamped with text from his diary, which you could take home with you, vintage object, paper objects. Um, you could uh, write in the remembrance book. Um, you went through these gold curtains and you went into Sebastian's space, which was this sort of shadowy space all light was sort of taken out by moving blankets that sort of reflected his peripatetic life. Um, and this, again, archival objects. That is a real Los Angeles Times announcing the retirement of Magic Johnson um, from when he got his HIV diagnosis. Um, yes, that's wallpaper on the walls. Good God, do we spend a lot of time putting wallpaper up um, and also couldn't damage anything. Um, this, is the, this is what I call the closet that nobody wants to leave. Oh my God, this is so beautiful. So this is a beautiful um, cedar armoire, like from the 1950s that I bought, um, which then I plastered with Tom of Finland, and then you, people opened it up and, and just, you know, got an eyeful, let's put it that way. Um, uh, more things, an aquarium, I <laughs> see 
<laughs> this is attention to detail. Sarah's like, I cannot believe this. I, yeah, I went to, I found a, a used aquarium on Facebook and I went up to Queens to get it because I wanted all that kind of, you know, schmutz, the gritty stuff that you get on a used aquarium. So there you go. It's a used aquarium with um, C.S. Lewis's Problem of Pain. Um, these are the, <laughs> these are wasps, dead paper, <laughs> paper wasps from actually Missouri. Um, uh, that if you go read the diary, you'll actually figure out what that means. Um, again, attention to detail. And this was the last room, which is a VR space where we're using archival 1970s kitchen chairs. Um, and these are haptic. So these actually have a subwoofer underneath. Um, Skywalker did this for us. He, they took the bass sound out of the car and put it through the subwoofer. So as the car starts to rumble, your seat actually rumbles. It's really fabulous. It's very simple. Um, and we remake it every time we, we, we move this piece. Um, we uh, you know detail. We went down to putting archival Missouri 1950s newspaper that uh, would be used as insulation under the under the wallpaper. And then the final part of this was uh, we spent about half of our budget on hiring artists, photographers to work with us. We asked as people after they went through the VR, went through the installation, if they would um, look for an object that um, spoke to their own story of love and loss. It, didn't have to relate to HIV, but everyone has one. Even you guys, I bet, have one, unless you've been super lucky in your life. Um, and then be anonymously photographed with this object. So no names, no faces, unless someone really wanted their face done. Um, and what you see, and what I'm going to show you, are these intense portraits of people with their objects, where they've actually taken their own personal memories and projected them onto these objects. It was intense. It was probably the most intense artistic experience I've ever had. Um, and these beautiful photographs that went out on our Instagram, again anonymously, and then they actually became part of um, installations as we went through. We had a month-long show at the Toronto International Film Festival Lightbox Gallery in Toronto, and some of these photographs were actually printed out and then put on the walls of the gallery. So again, this kind of iterative process of art making. Um, so uh, yeah, we're almost there. Yeah, the, so this, the, the, this guy, and then the story, so we asked people to write a little bit about why they picked the object. And this guy said, first of all, just look at his hands. We didn't tell him to grip this book of angels that way. The story he told was, he said he picked, and I know him, um, he's a very sort of stoic guy. He said that he um, picked this because his, uh, when he was seven, his brother, he's raised Irish Catholic, when he was seven, his, um, his three-year-old brother died. Um, and he recently was thinking about that and reading a book about having conversations with angels, and that's why he picked this book. So uh, again, intense experiences for people. Um, she was just a kick-ass woman. This guy lost his brother to AIDS, um, and he wrote about this being the pillow that his brother laid his head down on. Some were very amusing. This is actually Alexander Porter from Scatter, uh, who make Dev Kit. Um, I love this with the, the men, a man, this is from Flickr, man's uh, painted nail feet over this woman's breasts. Um, and, and I'm just gonna run quickly through. This is another, so these are the, this is at Seattle International Film Festival, much smaller space. Um, one in there, sort of Cracker Jack did it. Um, and again, everything interactive, you can interact with that. Um, this is the Lightbox Gallery, massive gallery in Toronto, uh, where we had to rethink how to use the space, um, sort of memorialize um, this, um, make it domestic and fail. Let's bring it through here. Again, using the moving box sort of as plinths um, made this um, really, what we could do it within budget, let's put it that way. Um, and it was quite lovely. Um, so we've gone on to do other ones. Um, we were in Mexico City. I don't have pictures of that, um, but I will stop there and, um, and say thank you. <laughs> Questions? Please give any kind of questions because I honestly we don't know what we're doing, so we'll, we'll, we can talk it through. I'm not, and I'm no in no way an expert on anything, but I have an opinion on most things. Well, 
while these guys are thinking questions, I'll go ahead and start us off in terms of <coughs> it's interesting hearing you say that we don't know what we're doing because I, I've said that before in class that this approach to storytelling is so new that even those working professionally or showing in film festivals are still figuring it out in a way. And I, I'm wondering with, with other VR filmmakers that you experience, um, you know, no one's been doing this for 10 years, 20 years, even five years, right? It, it's so new that there's there's no uh, veterans out there, if you will. There's no um, someone who's been a diehard that's been doing it for so long. But as you come across other uh, uh, other filmmakers working in this uh, in, with these emerging forms of media. Um, you know, what, what type of conversations are you having? What type of learning process are people going through? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, because there is no, um, you know, there are no veterans. And again, the language is being developed. Um, on the one hand, it makes it really exciting place to be, and you can find people to work with. If you have a good idea and you have a sense of where you want to go, people will want to work with you because um, there's just not a lot of good content out there, number one. And number two, um, it's exciting. It is exciting to be here. So, so we, you know, let's put it this way. If we were making a film, the likelihood that we could get a God Skywalker to do our audio post-production would be like zero. <laughs> like, even if we had a million dollars, no. Um, you know, our colorist um, was a film colorist. He had worked on one other virtual reality project. He basically did it for free, and we were experimenting. You know, he's like, let's, use, let's add a little grain, right? Like, that, that's, so it's exciting. I just talk to people and learn from people who have expertise in whatever area they're working in, and we have conversations about you know how to push the story along. But in the end, it, it does actually begin and end with story. I would say I, I don't. Um, I'm not really interested in. I, I mean, I need people who are technically proficient, but I don't want people who just are interested in the technology because that doesn't help me in my storytelling. Yeah. Uh, I think actually the workflow for VR filmmaking has got to be crazy because I mean, conventional filmmaking, you have your cinematography and then pre production, post production, you know, you're dealing with also using Unity and also the you know, sound design. Uh, how hard is it going to kind of get that all together to make the final product? Um, I can say it now, so many things could have gone wrong. <laughs> like, um, I, but they didn't. Um, I mean, uh, a lot of post-production had to go into that depth kit um, to get it to look that way. Um, and that was Scatter um, helping us um, for free, basically. Um, but if we had to do it again, um, I would now have a better idea of what it entails. Um, and, uh, and so for, we're going to make another... This, so we have four scripts, um, I mean, four episodes total that we have planned for, based on queer skins. Um, and the second one, which we're, I'm starting to do research for right now, um, in, uh, will include dance. Um, so it's, it's sort of a celebratory experience. It's actually an amazing, profound experience if you've seen this one, because Mary Helen, the mom who feels very guilty about rejecting her son, actually allows herself through reading the diary to imagine him in love, which is like for Mary Helen is a big, big deal. Um, and this actually, part, so part of this experience is actually a dance between these two men. And we're gonna film with Death Kit. And so this is, I have, there's one example of this that I can find anywhere that even Scatter doesn't know about. Um, uh, and I talked to the guy in Vancouver and said, okay, what camera were you using? What distance? Where were you going around? So I'm getting like tech details and realizing we can't just do what we did and, and go like 48 hours, let's do tech. No, 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 this is gonna take experimentation with, with real physical bodies and, and, and then you know, playing with it in, 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 with the depth kit. I, I, I'm, I don't know what the answer is, but I also know that nobody else knows what the answer is. But this is like, we lucked out the first time. I don't think we're gonna be lucky again. So I would, <laughs> I guess, now I know what, what where things could go wrong in this technology, some of the time anyways, um, and, and I would 
I would do it differently with more preparatory work, I would say, yeah. Have you found a, a preferred platform that you use? Uh, YouTube, Veer, in terms uh, of uh, promotion or distribution, rather? Oh, okay. All right, so let's talk about that. Um, funding, if you wanna make documentary, you can find money. Um, it is possible. Um, all, I don't know about Vive anymore, but Oculus still has Oculus for good. So it basically you pair with a not-for-profit foundation and do some kind of documentary work. Um, Tribeca has a lot of documentary grants. Sundance has documentary grants. If you want to do, we got hybrid documentary, hybrid fiction, nonfiction uh, through Tribeca, um, uh, which is pushing it, but still, that's okay. Um, uh, there is funding. We're looking at arts organizations. We kickstarted, which is really hard for VR because almost nobody who um, supported us ha has an Oculus Touch. So you're basically we're relying on people who want to want to support this content, basically. Um, and so um, so funding is is tough in in this right now because um, the the big platforms are going for Hollywood level kind of things um, and also no controversy whatsoever forget it i mean if you want to show you know victims of you know epidemics or whatever you you can do that but if you want to like really get into something like this you, you will not find money um or maybe you will maybe we hopefully we will too <laughs> so um that and then um showing it go broad because like we are now developing museum packets for small museums um, we realized when we went to tiff lightbox that having it there for a longer period of time with an installation was really the way we wanted to present things film festivals are crazy like people rush through and they're like oh i got i got two minutes to get to this other experience and you're like oh my god that's awful this is not how i want it to be so um uh Film festivals, media festivals, um, those are the places that you might show it. Distribution, you know, you're going to be on one of the platforms. You know, you're going to be Vive, you're going to be, um, I guess, Oculus Store. We haven't distributed for a number of reasons, some of them ethical, uh, about this kind of experience going out and having, just dropping people into headset and then having them come out and go, oh, well, now, now what? And actually, uh, this is a much larger conversation. I was going to put it out there, though. The ethics of storytelling in VR are really something that we need to start to think about. Because we have had people um, who are incredibly impacted by this experience. And, and so much so that when I was at Tribeca, I didn't leave. I was there for 10 days, 10 hours a day, because I was like, I got to help people with this. I, I can't just leave them here. Um, and when we were in, in Toronto, we educated the docents, the volunteers, and, and had them actually understand that they, they needed to talk to people when they came out of headsets. So, might we de we might develop an interactive website where people can actually sort of share their stories some some way to express themselves after this experience because it's very powerful but just dropping people into the experience and then going well bye you, you know there it is because vr is more impactful in general than film i mean you really feel like you've been there and so i think we have to start thinking through that um, so we haven't distributed yet that's those are the two major places is anyone get making money off of this some people have sold their work, a few now. Um, most of those have, like, like there was one by Dan, that was produced by Daniel Aronofsky. So if you can get Daniel Aronofsky as your, as your, um, as your um, producer, you might be able to sell your piece, <laughs> that's all I'm gonna say. Um, otherwise, just enjoy making in this space. Um, and honestly, the attention that you'll get, because if you make something good, you will be noticed because it's not like everyone is making a film. There is a place for you in this. So it's risky, you're not gonna make any money, it's hard to get funding, the tech can be difficult, but is it like the most exciting place to tell stories right now? VR, we're gonna move into AR, yes, I think absolutely that is true. And I will just say this, um, for, for women in the audience, for black people in the audience, you know what? This is not institutionalized yet. You have a way to get into a platform where it's, it's not, the barriers 
are still going to be there to a certain extent, but it's not institutionalized. So go now. Go now and, and, and start making in this space. Because in, in 10 years, the, the usual powers that be will be there. But now you have, a, you have a possibility. So if you want to think differently, get into this space now. That's what I would say.